question for coming. Um, there's a ton of great sessions going on, and, and uh, I know it's been a long two days, so uh, thank you so much for, for choosing to show up. Uh, I work for a company called Twilio, and I serve as a developer evangelist for them. Uh, so out of curiosity, how many of you have heard of Twilio before? Oh wow, that is so cool. Uh, how many of you use Twilio in an app before? That's also great. Um, so yeah, for those of you who haven't heard of Twilio, um, we're probably most known for making it really easy for developers to send and receive text messages and place and receive phone calls from inside their apps. So, this is how you send a text message using Twilio and Ruby. Yes. So it takes about three lines of code uh, to uh, knock out in the white space to, to send a text message. Uh, and so you can do about the same thing using phone calls. So from the large scale applications, folks do things like build full blown call centers using Twilio. Uh, from the uh, from the simpler use cases, or I actually like to think like some of the more important use cases, uh, we do things like uh, send, sorry, one second. We do things like sending uh, selfies of my dog. Here's a blog post I wrote recently. Um, and uh, so I taught my dog how to press this button. It took a picture using an Arduino and a webcam, and then it sent an MMS uh, uh, using that. So my dog's name is Kyra, and uh, apparently she's uh, pretty smart and that's been pretty great. Um, so we've always been about text messages and phone calls, this is at least what we've been most well known for. We recently announced video, which is super cool. We're gonna try to make it as easy to integrate video calling into your apps as it is to integrate SMS and phone calls into your apps. Um, and we just announced this uh, about a week ago, and if you'd like to get your hands on this early, uh, we're throwing a conference in about just a little under a month. It's called Signal. It's going to be out in San Francisco. Uh, we're going to have some amazing speakers. It is a developer conference through and through. We have some really super technical people. We're going to be talking about uh, just the, the tools and technologies that developers are using to ch fundamentally change the way that we communicate. Um, so we're pretty excited. If you are interested in going, come find me afterwards. I have a promo code for $75 off uh, the registration. So normally when I get up and give talks, I'm talking about text messages and phone calls, at least if I'm talking about Twilio stuff. Uh, today I want to talk about something quite a bit different. Uh, about, I think about two months ago, uh, we had our first ever acquisition in, in the history of our company. And uh, we joined forces with this company called Offie. And how many of you have heard of Offie before? It's almost a rhetorical question because I can't see anyone's hands anymore because of the lights. <laughs> But uh, Authy makes it really simple to integrate two-factor authentication into your apps. And I think that, you know, I gradually over the last couple of years become more familiar with two-factor authentication. I started uh, probably as a consumer of it through my email account, through Gmail, as most of you have. How many of you have two-factor auth turned on on your email account? Looks like about half of you. Um, how many of you have two-factor auth turned on on accounts that are not your Gmail account? Just on other accounts. All right. So I think it's really easy, or at least it's really easy for me, to always think of hacking that, as something that happens to other people. Okay. And fortunately, as far as I know, I haven't been hacked yet. Um, but you see these, uh, it seems like every week we're having another story of another huge uh, <coughs> compromise, security compromise, where a whole bunch of accounts are leaving. Uh, and it's easy for me to say, like, oh, I don't shop at Target. Uh, or, you know, like, uh, oh, I, I haven't used uh, Experian or something to check my credit, so I don't have to worry about that. But I read this article in Wired a couple weeks ago that really kind of crushed me as far as possibilities um, for hacking and also, like, the different attack vectors that people can go. Because I always kind of thought of, uh, you know, hacking as being the sort of thing that happens when somebody breaks the encryption or gets the master password and downloads the 14 million user accounts and whatnot. I read this story, though, uh, in Wired that kind of changed the way that I think about these things. Um, so this is tech journalist. He has a three-letter Twitter handle, Matt, M-A-T. And a couple of hackers decided that for the lulls, they thought it would be funny to take advantage to, to uh, secure his Twitter account. And so, 
they go to his Gmail, because if you get access to someone's Gmail account, you have access to everything, right? Like, once you have access to someone's email, you can request password resets for your banks, for your Twitter account, et cetera. Matt did not have two-factor auth installed uh, on his Gmail account. And I'll talk in here and says, you know, if I had had that installed, I probably could have prevented a lot of this pain and heartache. Um, and I'm just going to read you just a, a little bit of this article just to, to give you an idea of uh, how this hack happened. So it goes, at 4.33, someone called AppleCare claiming to be me. Apple says the caller reported that he couldn't get into his me.com email, which of course was my me.com email. In response, Apple issued a temporary password, despite the caller's inability to answer the security questions I had set up. And it did this after the hacker supplied only two pieces of information that anyone with an internet connection and a phone can discover. At 4.50, a password reset arrived in my inbox. I didn't use my me.com email, and I rarely check it, but even if I did, I might not have noticed the message because the hackers immediately sent it to the trash. They were then able to follow that link to permanently reset my Apple ID password. At 4.52, a Gmail password recovery email arrived and my me.com mail arrived. Two minutes later, another email arrived notifying me that my Google account password had changed. At 5.02, they reset my Twitter password. At 5 o'clock, they used my iCloud's Find My tool to remotely wipe my iPhone. At 5.01, they remotely wiped my iPad. At 5.05, they remotely wiped my MacBook. Around the same time, they deleted my Google account. At 5.10, I placed a call to Apple Care, And at 5.12, the attackers posted a message to my account on Twitter taking credit for that. Now, the most interesting part to me uh, about this was, he says earlier, that he was able to gain access, they were able to gain access to his me.com account using two pieces of information that anyone with an internet connection can discover. So what they did, they called up Apple Care, and Apple Care, in order to issue a temporary password, asked for his billing address, and uh, the last four digits of the credit card they had file, on file. It was like, so any ideas, how do you get someone's billing address? Someone who's technically savvy. Uh, who is? Who is, exactly right. Uh, they did a who is lookup on a domain that he had registered and he did not have who is guard uh, put on there. Any ideas on how you get the last four digits of someone's uh, credit card account? This one was most interesting. That, so that's super interesting because he says in the article, he goes, um, this is not how the hackers did it. But he goes, every single time that you call and order a pizza, you are giving the guy at the pizza counter enough information to reset your Apple because uh, you're giving them your address and you're giving your credit card number. Um, that's not how the hackers did it. Uh, so the hackers go to his Amazon account and, uh, and they, they want to do a, reset, a password reset on his Amazon account. But in order to do that, you have to have all the digits of a credit card and a billing address. And so they call up, they already have his address, right? So they call up and say, hey, I'd like to add a new credit card to my Amazon account. Here's my billing address, here's my email. So they're like, oh sure, why don't you do that? So they give them a, you know, like a gift card or something. They hang up, they hit redial, they call back, hey, I'm locked out of my Amazon account. They're like, okay, we're gonna need uh, the entire digits of a credit card number that's associated with your account and your billing address. And so they just gave him the credit card, they just gave. And then once you're signed into your Amazon account, he, go, he, says, he says the same information, those last four digits of the credit card number, that me.com fills are sufficient to reset your password, are shown in plain text on Amazon's site. And so this really blew me away because this was not, this was not like one of those widespread hacks that you hear about in the news, right? Like this was not some fundamental security breach. This was just a couple guys who, who you know, as far as you know, had very little actual technical skills. They just decided they wanted this guy's account. This is not necessarily something that, uh, that I mean, he goes on to say that they've now fixed some of these flaws and whatnot. But some of the hardest part about this was he said he lost his entire digital life. He lost access to all of his accounts. He lost access to all of the emails he had ever had. He had a ton of pictures uh, on, his, um, on his MacBook that he had not backed up, including pictures of him and uh, his newborn baby. Uh, and so he shows this picture here. He did, the story has a kind of happy ending. He was able to recover his MacBook, cost him $1,500 to get all the data restored. Um, and so he's able to get these pictures back. Um, but he says, you know, had 
I had Google two-factor off turned off. This whole thing wouldn't have happened. Right? Like the, the attackers compromised his account using entirely factors that we would re that they refer to in the security industry as things you know. Right? Using his billing address, using his credit card numbers, using his password. And he says, had I had that second uh, factor turned on, the something I have, and these hackers who were an ocean apart would not have had the ability to hack into my account. Um, we have seen over the last year a ton of high profile hacking incidents. And a lot of these, it's easy to look at a list like this and say, well, you know, I'm a developer, I don't really use uh, Adobe, or you know, I don't use LinkedIn. Well, you probably do use LinkedIn. Um, uh, you know, and to go down the list, but we had one just the last couple of weeks that hit the developer community pretty hard, right? We had uh, Slack got compromised. And Slack got compromised, um, they, they got full access to account credentials and hashed passwords. So, you know, Slack doesn't store passwords in plain text, as you would think they would. Um, but they did have a hacking incident. And what I found to be really interesting was the response that they had to announce the hacking incident. There's not even a comma between security incident and we're launching two-factor authentication. Right? Like, that is two-factor authentication is rapidly becoming the thing you do in order to prevent this from happening again. And so there's a uh, recent article in Slate, which is really interesting. You should give it uh, a read. Um, it says, every new software service should make strong security in from the start. And it goes on and, and it talks a ton about uh, two-factor authentication. It's basically what it's about. So uh, Google this and find me afterwards. Um, I learned a ton reading this article. And so this brings us back to the Twilio and Authy uh, combination, or I don't know, keep trying to avoid using the corporate term like Twilio acquired Authy, but I haven't quite figured out like, what the right word is for that. We joined forces, let's say. Um, in the history of Twilio, we've always been kind of a, say, hammers and shovels company. Right? Like, our goal has been to provide really strong tools to developers, and then to let developers build the final solution. All right? So we have not built a solution for, say, call tracking. We haven't built a solution for to build a call center. Our goal always has been to give you APIs and then to empower you to make it really easy to build the solutions that the rest of the world wants. But developers have always, first and foremost, been our customers. Authy is very similar in that their customers are first and foremost developers. But with, the, with Authy on our team now, this is the first time we've ever offered a full-blown solution. And the reason for that is a ton of the people who are using Twilio uh, we're using our SMS for the purposes of two-factor authentication. Um, but two-factor authentication, even if the SMS part is really easy for you, can actually be very difficult to implement. You have to worry about things like randomly generating the pens in a way in which um, they cannot be predicted. Uh, you have to worry about things like, okay, we can send SMS, but what happens if you're in a building like this and maybe your user's not getting cell reception? You know, what happens when your user travels to Europe and they didn't bring they don't have cell phone reception there? Um, what happens when they lose their cell phone? How do you enable uh, how do you enable two-factor authentication across multiple devices, even if you're taking the phone out of the equation? So there's a lot of ways that you can get two-factor off the wrong. It's way more complicated than just sending a text message, you know, randomly generating a six-digit code and sending a text message. And so it's been really fun. Authy is a customer of ours, and so it's been awesome. Like they are one of those developers who took our tools, built cool stuff on top of it, and went and empowered developers. And so it's been so fun watching. They went through Y Combinator. Uh, one of their first customers was Cloudflare. Uh, Cloudflare had a very high profile security incident in 2012, right as Authy was getting started. Um, the founder, Daniel, reached out to the Authy CEO and was like, hey, uh, you know, if you guys are interested in preventing this from happening again, I'm launching this thing. And so two-factor off, very much like Slack did, comes out after the security incident and says, hey, we've, been, we've enabled a two-factor off. And since then, since 2012, Authy's just totally blown up. Uh, they're used now by over 2,000 websites. They've got over 1 million users. So that is to say the aggregate 
of all of those websites and all of those apps, uh, the average of all of their users are, are over a million folks now. Um, and they're used by a whole bunch of people who, uh, you know, names that you know in the development world. So Code Climate, uh, uh, Equifax, which does credit reports, so you might not use them, but credit reports are pretty important. Twitch, um, and Coinbase, Chargeify and Coinbase is another one. Um, and so I want to show you just because what an end-to-end -end solution looks like on this. Because, uh, and so I want to show you Coinbase here. And I want to log in. I'm going to do this using how many of you use a password manager? Okay. For those of you who don't, please, please, please do. I started, I started doing it about a year ago. It's kind of a pain in the ass to get started. Um, but it really makes your life simple. Most people have three passwords, right? Like you have your Gmail password, and then you have like maybe your, your medium security password you use on all the financial sites, and then you have that other password that everything else uses. Um, and so if, you, if you're a part of one of these sites, there's a site you can go to, it's like haveibeenowned.com. Um, and uh, it's fantastic, you can look up and see if you've been compromised, and like I had an Adobe account that was compromised. Uh, anyway, so back to Coinbase. Uh, on Coinbase here, so I sign in, and then Authy has, they deliver the SMS to my phone. Um, and then they also have a, uh, a Chrome extension that I can use. And so I can come in here to Coinbase, and I can basically use my laptop as one of the things that I own.
So I want to show you that. I'm going to show you the code that we use to do that. And then I'm going to show you what it looks like to insert Authy into a pre-existing app, which is how most folks these days are coming about working with two-factor Auth. Um, so let me just show you how this works real, real quick. Uh, so I have, someone needs to sign up for an account. And in order to sign up for an account, um, all you need to punch in is a username and a password. Register here. And then once you get in, you get access to the super sensitive data that I have, which are, are baby pics of, of my five month old here. Uh, which obviously is a hypothetical app, because if you know anyone who has a baby, you know that uh, there is nothing that people hope, uh, are more willing to give away than pictures of their babies. Um, and uh, so I'm here, I'm logged in, I can access my account, I can see all the cute baby pictures. Let's just make sure that you get a full you know, view of all these. Um, and uh, then I'll sign out. Okay. And so let me show you just how that works, real quick, the account creation piece. So you can see from my schema, can you all see that okay? That's big enough? Okay. So the schema is the user model is really simple. So we just have an email and a password digest on here. So the password digest is a hashed password. So we're not storing passwords in plain text. And that makes use of Ruby's, or Rails has secure password here. And then we're just validating that the email uh, actually fits the regex of an email. And when you create a new account, you know, most of the time in Rails, whenever you're taking input from a form, you have two different actions. You have one action that displays the form, and then you have one action that processes the data that comes from that form. So here the new is the one that displays the new, the new user form. And then the create basically just takes the parameters, which we're defining down here, it's the email and password from the form. Um, and then if it's able to save that user okay, then it sets a session variable of user ID. All right, and that's what everything, all of our authentication on this app is going to be based off of. If there is a session variable of user ID set, then we will give them access to the account, um, to the account page. Uh, and, the, and we can see here on the accounts controller that we're calling this method before filter authenticate. And that's just inherited from the application controller. It's right down here. This is authenticate. And uh, basically, this just says redirect to the new session path or the sign up page, uh, or actually that's the login page. Um, anytime that, uh, unless you're signed in, and signed in is just looking at uh, is there a current user, and current user just basically says can I find a user in the database that's keyed off of a, the session, the user ID session variable set. So again, everything about this app is dependent upon we're setting a, a session variable of user ID, okay? And so if we were to then take a look at what happens when we sign in, this process is gonna be really simple as well. All right, so we're just gonna sign in, and I'm back into my account, and that was coming from the sessions controller, right here. Um, and I'm basically displaying the form, and then I'm grabbing a user, and then if the user is authenticated with the passwords, so this is where Rails is checking, it basically takes the password I put through the form, runs it through the same algorithm that it used to generate the hash passwords that are being stored in the database. And if that works well, then it sets the session variable and it redirects to a different account. Otherwise, uh, we just display a, a, an error message and we send them back to that page. And just to drive this home one more time, when we click the sign out button, all we're doing is setting that session variable back to no. Okay? So does that make sense so far? Moral of the story, session variables. All right? Okay, so now let's take a look at how do we inject a second step into the sign-in process. So how do we take how do we make it so that when somebody types in an email, and then when they type in their password, that they're going to get an SMS from Authy, and they're going to have to punch in that code into our Rails app in order to have access to the page? So the first thing that I had to do is go to Authy, sign up for a free account. Um, if you 
So what is it? I think an authentication is two cents, and if you are under three dollars in any given month, they don't send you a bill. So basically, it's free for development, and unless you're running, uh, once you get into production, you'll probably have a bill, you know, depending on uh, what your usage is. But it's going to be pretty low. Um, and so I need to grab my API key, and then my API key, I'm going to drop here into my secrets.yaml. So we'll just call this an Authy key. Or we'll call it off the API key. All right, and then I'm going to create a new file. Here I'll kill my real server, uh, and I'm going to create an initializer, and this is going to be authy.rb. And all I'm going to do here is set my uh, authy API key equals to the uh, the secrets coming out of my application secrets okay. actually I think this is the other way around secrets dot application actually I'm not sure does anyone know off the top of your head which was out of application not secrets all right trust your error good instinct thank you. Uh, if y'all see a mistake, please feel free to correct, all right? Um, and after we do this, we're going to include the, uh, the Authy gem. All right. Oh. Okay, and then, so then we'll drop in the Authy gem. All right. And we'll just go ahead, and I already installed the Authy gem ahead of time just to save us some time. We'll go ahead and start up our server just to make sure that we don't get any errors, make sure that uh, our initializer boots up fine. It looks like that's good. So in order to use uh, you know, the, the two-factor auth, we're going to need to collect the user's phone number. And we're also going to need to add an authy ID to their account. So we're going to create a new migration to add the authy information to our user. And we're going to need to add three columns on here. So to our user's account, or to our user's model, we're going to add um, an Authy ID. So this is going to be an ID that we get back from Authy, the scope to our application to uniquely identify the user. Um, we're going to add a phone number. And we're going to add a, a country code. Uh, we want to make sure that we are accommodating to international users. Um, and so, you know, U.S. numbers are prefixed by one, but not all U.S. or not all phone numbers in the world are prefixed by one. Now, we're going to do this here. We're just going to make the user type it into the form. Uh, Authy has some really sweet JavaScript to help with the selection of the country code and whatnot, but it's going to be a little ugly for our purposes here. Um, all right, so let's just run our migration. So we added our, our three columns here. All right. And now let's, uh, we'll change our view in order to accommodate, to, to add the field. So this gives another one of those spots that whenever I'm doing these live demos, uh, I'm always uh, met with a dilemma, right? So you have this dilemma of, do you show a super ugly form to your audience? Or do you input Bootstrap and show a super ugly view code? Uh, <laughs> CSS styles. Um, I've opted for the latter. I am totally open to suggestions. You can find me afterwards and let me know uh, if, as an audience member which way you prefer. Um, so, but basically, this is kind of ugly. It's mostly CSS. The real crux of it is we're generating a form, and then we have two fields. This is what you saw when we create a new user: um, one for email, one for password. So I'll just copy this here. And we're going to replace both of these. So uh, instead of a password, we're going to do, this will be a country code. All right. And instead of a password field here, this is just going to be a text field. And that's going to be, oh boy. Thank you. A country code. Uh, and then down here, this is going to be our phone number. Here is going to be a 
text field again. And this will be a block number. All right. Sound good so far? Yeah? All right, cool. Uh, let's just take a look. So this is going to be user's controller. This is, this is what's, again, displaying the form. Uh, this is what's creating the form. There's going to be some stuff we're going to need to change here when we create a new account. But let's just take a look real quick and just make sure that that form is displaying properly. All right. And that everything turned out well. This is my new little trick for, for most of my development. I display the console and the view so that I, I can do you know, stuff like this as I'm actually doing development. Uh, oh, that makes sense. All right, so let's do this. So, all right, so we just deleted the user that I do have. So when I come in here, I'm going to register, and we can see here that we have my form, uh, and I'm collecting a country code and a phone number, right? So we're going to do a couple things uh, here. Previously, we were solely saving the, that information to our local database. Now we need to create a new user and opt in. All right, so we'll do that here. If the user is saved properly in our uh, local machine, then we will use the opt in gem, and we'll uh, call this method called register user. In order to register a user, we need to pass in three bits of information. Any idea what those bits of information are? Instead of ID, we'll use the email. You're absolutely right. That is effectively our ID here. And then you're right. You said country code, right? Yep. And phone number. All right. And so now we are creating a new user. And then when we do that, Authy's going to return just a hash that has the ID of uh, like the Authy ID of the user. And so assuming we get that back, we're going to then update the user and we'll save that Authy ID that came back, all right? So let's run this again. And let's refresh this. And I'll now sign up for an account again. Oh, you're so smart. Thank you so much. Nice cat. <laughs> Thank you. All right, look good? All right, so country code, type in my super secret password, which is password, uh, and I'll register for an account, and there we go. So, and just to make sure that that worked right, we can look in here, and we can see that we do, in fact, have an Authy ID. So that means we are able to successfully hit the, you know, Authy's API and then we are then able to create a user here. And this actually, I think, was here from previously, but uh, you can look down here and see that we have, so if a, if a user is trying to re-register, it'll just give you back the same ID that you already have. Um, but you can see it shows up here on my dashboard. All right, so we have uh, successfully registered a user with Authy. And for this use case, uh, you know, often I think the, the best path is when somebody creates an account, you typically are just signed directly into your account, right? Like, it's very rare to go through this, uh, go through the path where you create a new account and then you're forced to sign in immediately afterwards. It's kind of jarring. So I think we're good to go here as far as what happens when we create a new account. What we want to look at next is what happens when the user signs out and then they come back to your site again. All right, so that's going to happen in our sessions controller which controls all of our sessions that are signing in and out. And I'll just come over here and I'm going to sign out. We're going to need to create uh, two more actions here. And so just as we have two actions in order to display the initial sign-up form, you know, the new and the create, we're going to create two more actions. One that we're just call two-factor, and the other one we'll call verify. All right. And we're going to need to create routes for those. We'll call that sessions two factor. And we'll do a post for our sessions verify. All right. And 
we're going to, this part right here, where we are creating our session, and we set that user ID uh, session variable, and we redirect it to the account path, that part we're going to move into the verify. I'm going to comment it out for right now, but we're going to come back to it, because we're basically moving that final authorization into something that happens after they verify their pen. Okay? Instead of setting that final user ID, I'm just going to set one called pre-2FA ID. And we'll set that to user ID. So now they make it to this step, even though that pre-2FA ID is set, the user ID is not set, so they won't be able to access the account page. And the next thing I do, so this is what happens when I, when I click the sign in form, right? Um, is I need to tell Authy to send them an SMS with a pen code. So I'll say here, Authy API, I want to request an SMS. And all I need to do then is send them the Authy ID that's stored in the, uh, the, store the database there. And then I'm going to re redirect them to the two factor path. Actually, this is a session. You know what? I thought so too when I was doing this, and uh, Authy, it's, their API is looking for ID, even though it's stored as Authy ID on our site. No, on your user object. Just oh, thank you. Code. Yes, instead of Authy. Yeah. Thank you very much. Nice catch. All right, so we're redirecting the session's two factor path. So let's create a, a, a form to have someone punch in a, uh, a code for us. All right. So we'll come in here to app and we'll drop into our views for our sessions and we'll just use that new form as a template. <coughs> right. And we'll do the same thing up top. So we we're just, I was displaying error messages here um, if they did not sign in properly. So we'll just call this here verification code. Or we'll just call it verify. And we'll display a warning if it shows up. Um, instead of having this form direct to the sessions path, we're going to have this direct to the uh, sessions verify path. All right, so when they click the submit button, it's going to take them to the verify action on our sessions controller. Instead of um, doing an email here, we're going to just call this code. We don't need to, to, to uh, display anything in that field when they first come to it. There's no default value there. Email field tag. What's that? Email field tag. Oh, thank you very much. All right, so we'll just do a text field, and then we'll delete that second field. We don't need that. And instead of telling them that we're going to sign in, we're going to tell them to verify. And you know what, actually, I want to, instead of code, for it really doesn't matter here, but I'm just going to call this token uh, just to be use the same terminology on the back end. It's not what the user sees. Uh, typically, the users think of these things as codes. Authy refers to them as tokens. So, uh, it'll just keep it consistent in the next code here. Change the label. Label tag code. Oh, you know what? Uh, I leave it as code. This is confusing. I almost just kept all the code. I leave it code for the purpose of like, sure, uh, <laughs> Just for the sake of consistency. All right. So, and then we do not need this bit here. All right? How do we look? It's making sense so far? All right. So our moment of truth here. <coughs> Things start up, so that's exciting. And so now I'm going to sign in. Let's just make sure. So we still have, you still see users still in the database, right? We have our Athi ID and everything. So I'm going to sign in. All right, so it comes up and says, verify your code. And I just got uh, a text message here uh, with my RailsConf secure code. All right. Now, if I type this code in here, nothing's going to happen just yet, because we haven't actually implemented that so far. But we are able to successfully send a code here. And this is kind of the cool thing uh, about Authy. So if I were to lose my cell phone, I can still use my computer as something I own with the Authy app. All right, so if I come on here, I can see my RailsConf pen. And so I don't actually need my cell phone here. I can actually just copy this from here 
and paste it right in to the form as well. Uh, so this allows you multiple you know, things you own, um, and it makes it a little convenient so that you're not having to, to punch, manually punch in these codes here. Uh, all right, so we're able to get a code. Now let's have the user be able to punch that code back in and verify that that works <coughs> on the opt side. All right. So we already covered this. This is what displays our form. So now we need to, on the verify side, so when you actually enter the code and hit the button, we're going to first grab a user um, from just in the same way that we've done up above. Oh, okay, so the user's already signed in, right? So user.find, and we're going to look at the session ID of our pre 2 fa All right, so that's just the same one that we set up here. So that stayed there stored uh, as a session variable as we've gone to that next page. All right. And so then if we have a user, we're going to do something. And that, uh, well, here, we'll do it this way first. We'll do, so first we want to get a verification. So in order to get the verification, we're going to have to hit off these API again. And we're going to run a verify. And we're going to have to send Authy two things. Any idea what those two things are? Exactly. User Authy ID and the token. And the token's being passed in the params. Okay, like that. Make sense? And then if the verification goes okay, then we're going to do the same thing that we had done here before. And we're going to set the user ID, and we're going to redirect to the account path. Oh, sorry. It goes up here. Otherwise, we'll do roughly the same thing that we had done when they didn't log in correctly, which is set a message, and we'll redirect them back to the two-factor account. All right, does that make sense? So this is very closely mirroring what our, uh, what our create method was doing before. All right, so here's our moment of truth. So we'll try this out again, we'll come back and try the uh, authorization process again and punch in my password, wait for my phone to blow up. All right, so I got punching my code 0926760. Oh, man. Undefined. Oh, you know what I think this is? This is just this. My apologies. All right. I was going all proper. All right. Oh, this is still more. Oh, missing template. Sessions. Oh. Sessions to vector pattern with formats. So your render is wrong. Yeah, drop the sessions of path on that. I'm sorry, say that again? It should just be render two factor. Oh, you're right. Okay. Thank you very much. Like that? Oh, just render two factor, not two factor. Yeah. You're absolutely right. Thank you very much. Alright, so that was our so basically I need to re-verify here. So So we'll get my token again. All right, we have 309-9719. All right, and now we have my baby picks again. And just so you can see what the uh, sad path looks like uh, properly, uh, if we punch in the wrong code, we do not get the baby picks. OK? So that's it. So that's, uh, I don't know, about 15, 20 minutes or so. And we were able to integrate two-factor authentication into a Rails app that has pre-existing uh, authentication. Um, so my hope is from this talk to encourage you to do two things. One, uh, forget the fact you're a developer. As a consumer and someone who uses the internet, enable two-factor auth on absolutely everything that you want. Um, 
it, it could save your life. I don't, that's probably hyperbole, but uh, um, it's just we're seeing the the incidents. They're they're just growing in an exponential rate, and two-factor auth will eliminate so many of the attack vectors um, that will allow uh, hackers across the globe in order to get into your account. And two, if you are you know as a developer, I would just strongly encourage you to implement two-factor auth using some method, preferably auth. But implement two-factor auth uh, into your own account. Um, it's the responsible thing to do for your users. Um, and if you compare it against the liability of either A, uh, say like lawsuits, or B, just the time and energy uh, associated and PR costs associated with a, a hack, um, or dealing with upset users, it is a no-brainer investment, especially if you can do something like this um, in, you know, let's just call it a day of uh, and working with a production app. So that's it. I'm up here. If you have any questions, let me know. But thank you very much.